I was asked a question about this along the lines that when I gave this talk before about the interaction between, if you like, the constitutional debate. And I said, picture yourself as a farm labourer in Waterford. You're on strike pay for about 10 shillings a week, which you have, with which you have to feed and raise your family. When you wake up in the morning, I said, which do you think of first? A 32 country republic, etc., 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 or how do I feed my children? And I said, I know which one I'd be thinking about. And in a way, this is the core thing in it, that there was another aspect to life in 1922 and 1923. Now, lest anybody be under any illusion, I'm sometimes referred to as Dr. McCarthy. The doctorate is in chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a lapsed chemist by trade, but a historian by interest. And this talk really takes its origin in two quotations. The first is from Frank Edwards, a name that will need no introduction, no explanation here. But Frank from Waterford. When he was asked by Unchin McCoy in the book Survivors about the Civil War, he said, there was another agrarian outbreak after the Civil War had ended. It was a localized Civil War, but maybe a more logical one. And remember, Frank Edwards' older brother, whom he worshipped, Sean, had been shot by National Army troops while, while he was a prisoner in Kilkenny Jail in 1922. But yet, Frank could look and say the second one, the farm labourers one, was the more logical one. The other quotation was this. Came across it on a wireless message from the commander of the Army Unit, the Special Infantry Corps, to Warford Commander. Use your own discretionary action to be taken. Use no half measures. Make an example of the place. And by God, they did. Now, let's outline the background. The casual laborers in Waterford, there were about 20% of the working population. It had the highest paid, sorry, the highest number and the lowest paid agricultural labourers in Ireland. Also did the highest density outside of the farming sector, the market gardening of North Dublin. Warford was the only county where you had more than two labourers on average per farmer. They were quite numerous. They had not unionized in either the city or the county. This is before the First World War. A lot of them didn't have the franchise, didn't bother registering. No leadership, no voice. But during World War I, the balance of power, the balance between supply and demand as regards rural laborers changed dramatically. You had the option now of recruitment. And recruitment, everybody that went had to be replaced. So unemployment practically ceased in Warford. It had been very high before the war, but now it, ceased, it practically ceased. There was a lot of separation money. But critically, unionization took hold among the farm laborers and the other casual laborers. The RIC County Inspector's reports, monthly reports, always paint a fascinating description. And there was one in September 1917 where the County Inspector writes that the farmers are enjoying their newfound prosperity. However, he says, they are very reluctant to share it with their laborers. 
but that would change. From 1917 on, you had a massive, um, oops, sorry, you had a massive drive for unionization of the rural laborers. And you can see there in the middle, in 1914, there was one branch of the Irish Transport Union in Waterford, in Waterford City. By 1917, it was not being recorded because it couldn't pay its dues to a central office. But look at 1918. And look there. Branches spreading across the city and the county. And that continued throughout 1919. And as a result, every parish had a branch of the transport union. There were full-time organisers. And in 1920, they were fully in support of the revolution. They took part in the general strike against conscription, the general strike in support of hunger strikers in Mount Dyle Jail, when the workers took over the running of the city and it was called the War of the Soviet. That then, also from May to December 1920, Warford, an important <coughs> railway hub, took a very active part there in the embargo on British Army travel on the railway. And again in 1922, in the general strike against militarism in April that year, Warford participated fully. So in the words of Emmett O'Connor, by 1921, the workers had created a powerful labour movement in Waterford, syndicalist in structure, socialist in ideology. And in 1922, during that strike against militarism, the strike showed the power of free labour to do anything it wished. Labour is opposed to free staters, republican and unionist alike. We are out for a work as Commonwealth. And apparently against the wishes of head office, the Labour Party in Warford in the general election of 1922 ran two candidates in the five seat constituency and both of them were elected. Plus a farmer's candidate, plus one pro-treaty and one anti-treaty, which of course was Cotton Brewer. But Labour won two seats. In 1920, the union negotiated, and in those days, it was done on a county basis. Every county would have a branch of the Irish Farmers Union. And the Warford Farmers Association, the local branch, negotiated. And the agreement was, for seven days, 38 shillings and sixpence per week. It was a living wage at last. And it worked out then six days, 35 shillings, um, indoor. Indoor meant you got your keep, board and bedding uh, and lodging and so on like that. 21 and sixpence, 19 and sixpence. And pro rata rates for women workers, relatively few, for boys, etc. But that 38 shillings and sixpence, was a living wage at last that they had achieved in 1920. And that became sacred. That had to be protected at all costs. Now that was agreed in May 1920. And before the end of the year, now the key man in the War for Farmers Association was Sir John Keane. Home from the wars where he had to give him distinguished service. He was very much involved. Now, in an interesting career. In his early days in the 1890s, he was very much a unionist. But as that decade progressed, he began to see that the least worst option, his words, for Ireland was home rule. So he became a reluctant, very reluctant, support of home rule. He was very interested in agriculture 
and was widely seen as an informed and reforming agriculturalist. And as such, he was appointed to the Senate by W.T. Cosgrave, also serving the Warford County Council. But when it came to labour relations, he wrote, Farmers should refuse to negotiate with union officials as a matter of policy. It's between the farmer and his <coughs> laborers. The union have no place in this relationship. And he said, the Irish Farmers Union should have a strike breaking capacity. Interesting, a strike breaking capacity. A farmer's freedom force. Now, <coughs> Almost as soon as the agreement had been signed in 1920, the 38 shillings a week, the post-war economic boom ended and farmers immediately began to think cutbacks, cutbacks, cutbacks. There was, in that period, there was growing unemployment and even though the war of independence was raging, there was significant recruitment in Ireland to the British Army in the south. Because a lot of guys who had been demobilized in 1919 came home, many of them had left unemployment to join the British Army in 1914. They came home to unemployment. And with the situation worse, some of them rejoined. Quite a number rejoined, particularly in Munster. Surprising aspect. And employers began to have one agenda, and one agenda only, wage reductions. Now, in 1921, there was some talk about not renewing the agreement. But given the state of the country, the war of independence at its peak, the RIC had left the countryside. They had abandoned all these small barracks so that the countryside was essentially unpoliced. The farmers dare not take the chance of enforcing wage reductions. So despite a lot of grumbling by the farmers, the 1920 rates were renewed again in 1921. But it was a different story in 1922. When it came up, for negotiation. So John Keane offered 30 shillings a week. And a county-wide strike began. But the transport union were ready. And they said what they would do is they would target individual farmers. They would put a blockade around individual farmers. Nothing would be allowed in or out until the farmer agreed to continue. They would blockade the roads. And bear in mind, Warford is outside the jurisdiction of the Dublin government at this stage. And within days, the Voice of Labour, the trade union newspaper, was proclaiming, Warford will win. First stage of farm fight are partly. The garden already settled. Export reports, excellent reports from all other areas. A couple of days later, Warford winning all the way. Farmers flogged in the five day fight. 60% surrender already, which two weeks later was 90%. So they were winning on the surface at least. Farmers individually were signing up. But that was happening primarily in East Warford and mid -Warford. It was far different in the West. There were large estates there, Sir, jo Sir John King's, the Ushers, other ones throughout the West, and they hung out. They were determined to see it through. Now, I put down their reaction of the IRA, and it's very, very interesting. In the East, a lot of the IRA, particularly in Warford City, 
were trade union members. And at one stage, a number of them were sent out to disperse a labourer's uh, meeting. And certainly, some of the trade uh, some of the IRA members in the East said, "This may come to shooting, and if it starts, I know which side I'll be on. I know who I'll be aiming at." There was that solidarity in the East. But in the West, where most of the IRA were farmers' sons, different story altogether, they broke some of the blockades. Now, that was a pass. If you, as an individual farmer, signed up, you got a pass, which allowed you to have food, etc., brought into your farm. There's a wonderful document which I put up on a website on the Church of Ireland Representatives Library, Emily Usher's memoirs, The Ushers of Kappa House. And she talks about, in the first place, a train load of roughs had been imported from the city of Waterford. If it was a bit older, I'd have qualified. Um, <laughs> armed with sticks to enforce a lightning strike against the proposed reduction of wages from 35 shillings to 30 shillings, in our case, which had come into force on May the 20th. And none of our labourers had protested. So she's blaming the imports. Her son recollected this blockade slightly differently. We, the besieged, lived, not happily, for two months on tin sardines and other foodstuffs which could be imported by devices known to smugglers. For the pickets were chivalrous and did not press their investigations too far, especially in the case of ladies. Sometimes friends on motorcycles would run the blockade with parcels. In the evening, our bewildered proletariat, more than half full of drink, would gather in dark swarms on the roads, fatuously waving red flags. A sensational news sheet was handed around among the demonstrators, in which our little farm strike was represented as a sort of western front of the Great War of Revolution. No, okay, it's a young fellow's recollections of it. But the strike was broken in the West. That was important. And the labourers accepted the 30 shillings a week. Now, the voice of labour then spoke about Keane's battered halo, Sir John Keane. The employees sometimes will return to work against the instructions of the union at the 30 shillings rate which that devoted friend and sage counsellor of the workers, Sir John Keane, had in mind for all the war for labourers. It is decidedly not his fault that 90% of the men in the county have gained a full wage. The ratting of the employees in these three jobs is deplorable, but we have less contempt for them than we have for Keane. For his feat in humiliating his men, he is now welcome to all the glory that is his due in this world and the next. The end is not yet. In other words, this is half time. The workers had won, mostly, the first half. But what were the lessons from 1922? For the labourers, a short strike was winnable. And that was key, it had to be a short strike. Control of transport, use of violence if necessary, unity and sympathetic action was absolutely necessary if they were to win the strike. The farmers learned equally that unity of all farmers was essential, that they must be prepared to meet violence with violence, and that government support was essential. And also, they would need a fighting fund and that they would be able to call upon support, financial and otherwise, from the farmers' associations in the surrounding counties. So if you like, the stage was now set for the big confrontation. 
So John Keane got a worthy opponent. In January 1923, James Baird, seen on the far side, that's him with his family, was appointed Irish transport organiser in Waterford. James Baird had been driven out of Belfast as a rotten prod. One who believed that the workers' rights, looking after the workers, which he did in the shipyards as a trade union representative, was more important than any sectarian fighting. He was driven out, he came south, got a job at the transport union, who sent him down to Waterford. And Baird was an utterly, totally committed socialist. And I would suggest to you that with John Keane on one side and James Baird on the other, the chances of a compromise were absolutely zero. Both of them were determined to win. There was a warning to the laborers. Note the fact that starting in January, there was a gas worker strike in Waterford. Now it's interesting, that started off with a dispute between the Transport Union and the Dockers Union as to who would trim the coal that would be unloaded for the gas works. It was a pure inter-union dispute. Within two days, the management of the gas company had transformed it into one which was centered on a reduction in pay, an increase in numbers, and a reduction, sorry, an increase in hours, and a reduction in the number of workers from 70 to 40. A different agenda. The basic agenda of the employers had taken over. In response, the workers occupied the gas works, declared a Soviet, and for a couple of months, ran it, supplied the gas, collected the bills, etc. But one Saturday evening, the National Army moved in and he evicted them. He evicted the strikers. Then, the management simply closed down the gas works, cut off the gas for the city, and that continued until August, when the workers essentially had to surrender. And that was, in a way, a warning that the army could be used, and that the real agenda for everybody, less money, more hours of work, and reduce the number of workers. It was, if you like, a warning. The final offer came at a meeting in the Granville Hotel at the beginning of May. 30 shillings a week, and so on. Not only was it 30 shillings a week, the original 38 shillings had been for a 45 hour week. The 30 shillings would be for a 54 hour week. Combined, you're talking about a reduction in hourly rate of over 20%. Even Sir John Keane said, we admit it is not a generous wage, but it is as much as the industry can stand. Needless to say, the workers rejected it. James Baird, in a letter to head office, said, 100% of the workers are for a strike. We will not accept that proposal under any circumstances. And so, 17th of May, the strike began. And almost at once, the workers had a number of significant victories. The day after the strike began, there was a load of butter being sent from Tremedian Creamery to the UK, main market. The labourers wouldn't have had to do with it, so the farmers brought it in themselves, in cars. When they approached the dock near Regiment's Tower, there was a large crowd of labourers and supporters, but they didn't use any violence. Army and guards managed to clear a path through. 
When they got to the dock, the dockers refused to load it. The farmers then said they would load it. And with the dockers standing by watching, the farmers loaded it onto the ship. The crew had watched this and then told the captain they were not willing to sail as long as any of that butter remained on board. The captain, mindful of the tide, time and tide wait for no man, was anxious to get on the way, so he asked his crew would they unload it. And they agreed to unload it. And it is said that while they were unloading it, a, signif a significant amount slipped into the river. <laughs> the farmers were forced to bring the butter back. So solidarity was working. Two days later, you had another example. This time, farmers were coming into the grain stores in Waterford to load feed for their cattle. Every cart had a soldier in it, escorting them. When they reached the grain stores, again there was a big crowd, and this time there was quite an amount of street violence as the guards and the army forced a way through forced a way through to the stores. The men in the stores refused to load the carts and all of them were immediately sacked. The farmers loaded the carts themselves and escorted by the army headed back out. When they reached a place called Ballyduff Glen on their way, they came under sustained rifle and revolver fire from the hills around them. The army re re replied. There was about 20 minutes exchange of gunfire between the army and presumably strikers before the gunfire ceased and they were able to continue on. So that was the flavour of the strike. They got huge sympathetic support. Creamy workers, domestic servants, factory workers, shop assistants would refuse to serve farmers and would then be dismissed. Roads blocked. So it appears as if they are winning. The committee, the Secretary of the War Farmers Association, wrote to the Minister for Home Affairs. My committee have had difficulty in restraining the young impulsive members of the Farmers' Union from committing serious reprisals on the strikers. As they point out, the strikers are boasting that the government will not, through their courts, punish them for their illegal acts and sabotage. It is therefore respectfully submitted that sufficient free state troops should be supplied to patrol the roads at night and to issue coffee regulations, and also that all accused persons should be tried expeditiously and in proved cases severely dealt with. The key thing in that is the tone of, you do something, or the young farmers who later style themselves the white guard, you don't do it, we'll do it. Now, there was also in this period, the army are reporting about involvement of the irregulars, even though the Civil War had officially ended. Now, there is no proof whatsoever that the anti-treaty IRA had any interest in forging an alliance with Labour. Therefore, some of them, like Lee Meadows had before he was executed, and Pat O'Donnell, had argued strongly for such an alliance, but in general, the irregular leadership had no interest in it whatsoever. They were fighting separate battles. Even though, in the army intelligence, it says, their being of the laboring community themselves are only too willing to carry out operations which may suggest otherwise. Any participation by irregulars was on an individual basis. Now, I want to step back a bit. That's 
a well-known quotation by Kevin O'Higgins. He talked about that in November 1922, the provisional government were simply eight young men in the city hall, standing amidst the ruin of one administration, with the foundations of another not yet laid, and with wild men screaming through the keyhole. He was so fond of it, he repeated it at every speech version for the next four years. But people always think he's talking about the irregulars. He was. But he was also talking about what he believed was widespread anarchy throughout the country, particularly in rural Ireland. And in that, he had a huge ally in Paddy Hogan, the Minister for Agriculture. And together, in November 1922, they brought a memo to government. And some parts of it, no police force was functioning throughout the country. No system of, of justice was operating. The wheels of administration lying idle, battered out of recognition by the clash of rival jurisdictions. Then he went on, and th this was real Higgins. And he's talking about November 1922. Anti-treaty support was not Republican idealism but greed, envy, lust, drunkenness, and irresponsibility under a political banner. The irregular campaign depended on the support of people in possession of land and property, not legally theirs. People who owe money or are engaged in illegal activity, such as peeing for gene making. And himself and Hogan put forward the solution the army must act as armed police as well as military in order to vindicate the idea of law and order the government. Put out the army to do it. Richard Mulcahy, Minister for Defence, was totally opposed to this. He argued repeatedly that just as they were trying to get the army accepted as the national army, the army of the state, if you send them out to break strikes, to round up machine makers, to enforce legal bills, you're repeating what the British Army had done in the 1880s and 1890s. But he was overruled. And in the end, they set up the Special Infantry Corps. Local officers and men don't like this sort of work. It would be very much better if the job were given to an officer and men who were unknown to the locality. In other words, if you have this problem, you're better off not involving the local garrison, but sending guys from outside who will do this work. And by the way, the Norman army did not like these guys. They sort of giving them a bad name, <clears throat> being undisciplined, etc. So you will send in these guys and this Special Infantry Corps, originally it was planned to have about a thousand men in 20 units, each of 50 men. But it expanded, it expanded, until there were over 4,000 men in it. And their duties were specified. They were not to engage with search or arrest irregulars. Leave that. Your job is very specific. Stop rural anarchy. Bear in mind, the guards that occupied most of the towns at this stage, they could be trusted to do that. But in rural Ireland, where you had a lot of armed men, it was the army, the Special Infantry Corps. They would combat land grabbing, cattle driving, unlawful grazing, strikes for cheat making. There are stories of them being remarkably unsuccessful at the latter. That a lot of the Pacina they seized evaporated on the way to the barracks. Enfor they would apply enforcement orders. So these are the guys who were sent down. And that's the response. Two battalions of the Special Infantry Corps arrived. And were told by a reporter from the Manchester Guardian. The post of the Special Infantry Corps 
are scattered all over East Waterford, wherever the farmers' organization considers its members to be in danger. Now, farmers began to use small ships to import feedstuffs. They couldn't do so through Waterford, and they would be guarded by members of the Special Infantry Corps. The employees, shopkeepers, etc., formed employer protection associations, and martial law was imposed. A curfew, 10 o'clock, out after the curfew, you could be arrested. And then came the instruction that I quoted earlier on. Commandant Paul would be instructed by GOC command to loan you necessary transport. Clean up the area at once. Use your own discretion and there's no half measures. Make an example of the place. As I said, they did. One of the key jobs was guarding, trashing and harvesting. And there's a wonderful photograph. And you can see it wasn't exactly a small farm or a small farmer that they were there. You can see the neighbours gathered to help the soldiers on guard duty. A creamery being guarded by members of the Special Infantry Corps. A ship being unloaded under guard. And there's another photograph that I came across recently, and it's much clearer than that. I'm sorry I didn't use that particular one. But it shows small children watching as the ship is being unloaded and the Special Infantry Corps watching it. And if you look closely at the photograph, the kids are in bare feet. Was it the fine weather or poverty or a combination of both? In military archives, you have the weekly reports from all the various posts. They were scattered in small uh, posts around. And you can see there various places where the reports are. Typical report, every week, roads were constantly patrolled. On the night of the 6th, hay, the property of John Halley of Tremor was burnt. Sergeant Callan in charge of patrol arrested four boys on the main road. They were later released. On the night of the 5th, Michael Pierce, James Fennelly and James Summers were arrested for a breach of curfew. A shot had to be fired over their heads before they halted. After investigation, they were fined five shillings each. But also, and not mentioned in the reports, under the curfew, under the military, under the flag martial law that was being applied in East Waterford, you could be arrested and detained, as well as being fined. I went down through the reports in for July. I found 63 strikers were arrested for curfew violations, and they would be fined 10 shillings, 5 shillings, more often 10 shillings, which is essentially a week's straight pay. And in that same period, only one farmer was arrested for being out after the curfew. He was fined 5 shillings and immediately released. Three of the strikers who were arrested for curfew breaking in early July were still being detained in September. We're never charged with anything. And they were detained in a makeshift camp set up in the grounds of the courthouse in Waterford, where the Special Infantry Corps were billeted. Part of it was used as an impromptu prisoner of war camp, in tents, in the rain, etc. And detained there, if you were lucky for a week, if you were unlucky, could be a month. Now, there was an electoral interlude in August, a fascinating election, but one of the comments made by the London Times, and it was reprinted, the general election in Warford takes place under the shadow of intense class conflict. So again you had two elections almost. The Republicans against the pro-treaty and the farmers against the uh, farm labourers. 
Robert Kennedy and Nicholas Wall, and this is a constant cry of them. It's our money they want now. Next year, it'll be our land. And that wasn't helped when James Baird <coughs> was, no Irish farmer, great or small, has the right or title to the land he held, except by the conquest of Cromwell and acts of the English Parliament. And he kept repeating this, that the labourers had as much right to the land as the farmers. And he was very fond of concluding, we may not have clothes nor cattle nor comfort, but we have these, and he would pull out a box of matches. He would later be arrested, accused of inciting incendiarism, and spend time in Kilkenny prison, where he went on hunger strike. But this was it, and now. I don't know if anybody, even in those days, would read an electoral poster with all of that writing in it. But the headlines are important. <laughs> Thou shalt not steal Bolshevik doctrines preached in Waterford. The cause of the farmer the righteous one is the struggle against unchristian doctrines and methods. And the all that fails to appeal to Christianity. But that was there, and it was a bitter strike at both levels, the constitutional one and the farmer's one. Now, interestingly, the constituency had been changed to four seats. The farmers held their seat. Labour lost the seat. Interestingly, Baird scored highest on the two um, Labour candidates, but he was transfer unfriendly with his speeches. Now, we're entering into September. The farmers, the laborers have started burning hayricks, etc., as reported. The farmers, claiming to be a white guard, responded. Pat Murray of Dunhill, Transport Union Shop Steward, was warned by a union official that there were rumors around that the farmers were going to get him. It came at 2 a.m. on the 10th of September when the door of his cottage was smashed down and he and his brother and sister were ordered out and shot fired over their head. Petrol was then poured over their furniture and set on fire. When the premises was well alight, the four men drove away in a motor car, passing a military patrol which did not stop them. That's just a typical example. That week, the cottages of some seven trade union activists Dalton, in command of the Special Infantry Corps, scribbled on one of the reports that came in, regrettable, but the best method to stop the burnings by the labour crowd. The guard, chief superintendent, said, suspicion that the Special Infantry Corps were directly involved in burning of cottages. And he was probably right. A weekend of frightfulness. Book, local newspaper again. Between the hours of 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. on Sunday morning, the cottages of Messrs. Dalton, Murray, Carey, and O'Shea were likewise visited by masked and armed men in motors, and again burned out. Another example: Patrick Heaney, secretary of the Butlertown Transport Workers, was stopped while on his way home a few nights later. He was robbed of four pounds, ten shillings, and severely beaten with the butts of revolvers. So this is September now. And at this stage, it has to be said, the laborers, the union, are getting desperate. John King is making it quite clear that they can continue on for another year if necessary. The teacher and the Minister for Agriculture suggested arbitration. John Keane said no. They were not prepared to talk to the union. Any individual labour labor could go and talk to um, his former employer. The farmers kept insisting on discipline and there's a report of a reprisal against the farmer 
who had signed with an, an agreement. And on the other side, the transport union were equally attacking strike breakers. And there's one reported instance where six strikers with armed with sticks approached three men who had returned to work on a farm near Ballygunner. There was a bit of a brawl. One of the guys who had returned to work had taken the precaution of, build, of bringing a revolver with him. He produced it and shot one of his attackers in the hand. Those six, the men from the Union, you know, it wasn't an official Union thing, were all arrested and spent time in prison. The others were deemed to be simply defending themselves. So again, it's this, but bit by bit, it's cracking the end of strike. And more and more guys are going back to work, purely out of starvation. We can't afford it. In the three months in the summer, £1,295 was remitted to the union, to head office, union dues. In strike pay, they spent £17,348 in that same period. And William O'Brien, in his biography, said, it looked as if it was going to wreck the whole union. And we had a consultation with the executive about it. And they said it was all over now, we would have to end it. We decided we would stop the strike on a certain date. But they didn't tell any, everybody. They came down to a meeting, David Ford and William O'Brien in Warford, to the trade union representatives on the 8th of December, and told them, you've got your strike pay today. That's the end of it. No more strike pay. Baird, at this stage, freed from prison, argued, 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 fight. Let's have a general strike in the city and county. Let's call everybody out. Let's take direct action. Occupy some of the farms, the creameries, etc. But no, he was shot down. So then they issued a public statement. In order to save the organization locally, it was decided that all should return to work forthwith and await a favourable opportunity to recover lost ground. But there was no overall return to work. You came back to work if and when a farmer decided he wanted you. And it's estimated that over 60% of them were never taken back. They were given the choice of the dole or the boat to England. It was a disaster. And then following in, Liam Curran, Chairman of the Workers' Council in Waterford, summed it up at the general meeting early in 1924. They were told that the day that the Free State Treaty was signed, that they had obtained the greatest Magna Carta the world had ever seen. Well, now they, the workers, had no work, and they could lie out in the fields or stand on the quay and look up at the flag on Regiment's Tower and say, now we are free. Free to go home and starve with our wives and children. It had been a disaster for the Union, and it wrecked the Union in Waterford, for, and for decades afterwards. What about Special Infantry Corps? It was disbanded in December 1923. A couple of months later, Kevin O'Higgins and so far as he ever gave praise, praised him saying, the Special Infantry Corps performed this task well, established in a memorandum of the Minister for Agriculture and myself, it did rough and ready work in stamping out agrarian anarchy and other serious abuses. It had done its job. It had safeguarded agriculture and the farmers. Fifty years later, one of the strikers, had a different recollection. Interviewed by Emmett O'Connor, he said, and this is the Special Infantry Corps, they were recruited from the scum of Ireland. They did an awful lot of drinking. Most of them were tinkers. They patrolled the roads after 10 o'clock. I might cut out after that was held in their camp in the courthouse for a week or two and charged it suspected of anything. 
the courthouse was surrounded by barbed wire. Different memories of it. But it was an appalling situation and it was a second more logical civil war. Thanks. <laughs>
That's how I saw it. I'm just, I know it's sort of confirming what you're saying, but that's, that is confirmed in my research as well. And indeed, if I might make the point, there's a very good recent uh, biography of Liam Lynch. Uh, and uh, the early part of the book talks about his family background. And Liam Lynch's grandfather was murdered because he was a landlord who had got back his property from a mortgage. Uh, where he had debts. And he evicted all the tenants when he got the land back. And on the back of that, obviously, a kind of white biasm or whatever was the, the local manifestation. I killed him one night. So that was his kind of class background. And uh, obviously, he wasn't going to be in the corner of the labourers, whether it was in Waterford or Kerry or anywhere else. They just had a different mindset. Uh, I think Noel wanted to come back in, then I'll go to Donald and Pat. Yeah, my, my, my question is, is, is who were the farmers? Uh, you know, um, you still have the big estates in West Waterford, yeah. as you said, but not in East Waterford. So were these people who had gotten land relatively recently, in the previous 20 years, say, under some of the Land Acts, or the precursors of the Land Commission, uh, you, you know, so uh, they were, I suppose the question is, they were kind of insecure farmers in, in, in that sense, maybe, with a, with a folk memory of, uh, or, or were there, was there an earlier, you know, redistribution of land in, in East Waterford? I think in East Waterford, because of the prosperity that was there, a lot of land had been transferred beforehand. And during the land war and afterwards, Waterford, there's something like 60% something like of the land was transferred compared to 70, 80, 90 percent in other counties because a certain amount had taken place beforehand. And I remember making the point when talking about and using as a phrase in the um, Ernie O'Malley I quote as saying when he's talking about the War of Independence said, you know, Warford hasn't done much either. And really what he was talking about was East Warford. And in the prosper, prosperous places like the valleys of Black Water, the Bride and the Shore, big farms, prosperous farms, adjacent to Ready Market with the port straight across to England. Wasn't the first time run for revolution? You know, uh, in the arms struggle and so on like that. So you had quite an amount of transfer beforehand. And in, you had, as I say, that photograph, the one that I colorized, that was not the shed of a small farmer. You know, that, and you had a lot of those in Warford. It was very prosperous in that. You know, so. Now, it had also, that area in East Warford, it had benefited immensely before the war from the local MP. Because John Redmond was a very, very good man in looking after his constituency. You know? So there was a lot of that in it. There was a lot of prosperity around, but it did not extend down to the labourers. Pat? Yep. Sorry. Pat Bolger? Oh yeah, sorry. Just just an observation. Like I think we all lament why two strands of activism in Ireland didn't unite, right? So the, the more advanced Republicans are the socially conscious ones, and the Labour movement. Even though some people have crisscrossed both of them in the in the preceding ten years. But my question is, uh, the landlords did any of them feature in any way prominently in the in the land annuities troubles in the thirties? Was there constancy to them, or did they fade away after that period? Were they were they present in politics after that period? Very much so. Mm. The and most of them would have been wearing a blue shirt in the time in the 1930s. And you had a very strong farmers party in Waterford and you had the blue shirts and so on like that. And, you know, um, when you see some of the photographs of them and people like the son of, the son of Lord Waterford, Beresford and Clare, in his blue shirt marching along and so on like that, oh, they were prominent all right. But, we know which party they favoured, yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much, Pat. That was 
most interesting, and I think the title of Dr. Pat is well merited. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I had two quick questions, if I might. Uh, I was struck by the fact that the uh, unionisation uh, of the labourers in Waterford, in your slides, I, uh, as I saw, was relatively rapid between what was it, 1902 and 1914 and the outbreak of the war. Uh, and I just wondered, and I suppose it's, it's a variation of one question already asked, but I, I wondered how active uh, Michael Dallet and the Land League and Parnell and uh, the agitation towards the end of the 19th century uh, on the land question uh, might have been relevant in terms of the, the relative speed of, of unionization. And uh, my second question is more specific, but again, uh, you mentioned the, the crucial area of West Waterford. Uh, and I had, I'm reminded of a very enjoyable visit to Curramore House, mm. uh, a very wealthy uh, landlord, uh, Lord, well, you just mentioned yeah. that big Lord, Lord Waterford. Uh, but it was one of the few houses, or well, certainly one of the major stately homes in Ireland, that, that wasn't uh, burnt down or attacked or otherwise involved uh, at that time and I just wonder was there a special reason for that? Did uh, the borrower have a, a, a good relationship with his own workers? So something like seven houses burnt during the Civil War period in Waterford. Out of quite a number. Particularly in East Waterford, you did not have the infrastructure, the IRA infrastructure to participate in any of these. And for other ones in West Warford, there's a huge range. Some of them, you wonder why they were selected. Okay, Sir, Sir John Keane, Senator, who had voted for the emergency power bill which led to the executions. His house was burned, understandably you might say. The house of P.W. Kenny, another senator who had voted, was in Warford City, just in the outskirts of Warford City. Too dangerous, too many soldiers around there to try and burn that. But then you had at the other extreme, you had a wonderful house on the Blackwater, Ballina Trey House. And, and this is the side, but it shows you how nothing is ever really simple. The Horroyd Smiths, very much a landed gentry farmer, uh, family, war service by the husband, etc. During the truce, there was a burglary in her house, Mrs. Horroyd Smith in the, in the mansion, and also a lot of theft of salmon from the salmon weir on the river. And she complained to Pax Whelan. Chief of Staff, Chief of the local, local IRA, Brigade Commander of the local IRA. He identified who had done it, got the material back, and ordered the guys to be banished. And Mrs. Horroyd Smith thanked him and said, if there's ever a gang duty, just let me know. <laughs> he left. A year later, two IRA men from that neighborhood are caught in arms, brought to war for prison, and sentenced to death. She, Pat Whelan, asked her if she would make representations. No problem. She wrote to Cosgrave, to Higgins, to Hogan and Ms. Ryder to one Cahill, pleading on behalf of these two men. And one of the last letters that one of them, Paddy O'Reilly, wrote before he was shot, was a short note to Mrs. Holroyd Smith thanking her for her intervention. Now, I would say that could give a certain immunity to have <laughs> our house born. <laughs> so all of these, I think you could look at each individual house as to why. But I don't think in Waterford that any of them, now Terry Cooley has done tremendous work on this, looking at why, in a lot of cases, it was agrarianism. 
The domain was still there around the big house. Burn it, get rid of it, and we carve up the land. There was no sign of any agrarian motivation for any of the seven houses burned. And as a matter of fact, every one of those seven was rebuilt. You know? And one of them was rebuilt and was later the refuge of the Dutch war criminal who had fled to Ireland after the Second World War along with his art collection. And he lived there for years, you know. But, yeah. Francis? Yeah, I want to say before I suppose so, thank you very much, Pat. I hope uh, a version of this that will find its way into the pages of Sega. Uh, not least because one of the sort of, I suppose in my head anyway, classic articles that we published was Howard O'Connor's initial study of the Spanish yeah, Treaty. Yeah, absolutely. Was right, that this obviously complements yeah. it and extends it. The second thing which I think is very interesting is how you can find the evidence of organisation uh, in the evidence of oppression. I think the use of the military archives relatively new to labor historians, <coughs> but we should go to it. In um, Right Not Profits, uh, a book looking at labor outside of Dublin and Belfast in the period, uh, we published um, Joseph, Christy Supple from a thigh parallel strike, his illegal detention, and all that was based on the file in the military, uh, military uh, uh, archives, which I think is, uh, you know, Again, it's just very interesting that, that that would be there. And there's no doubt the absolute class nature of the state. Uh, and Fergal McCluskey has a, an essay of the forthcoming 50th anniversary collection for the Society that we published in September, where he looks at what he would describe as the counter revolution uh, in both periods. The Transport Union in Watford, you're quite right. If you look at a map of uh, membership distribution historically for the ITU, you strokes into. Uh, the only sort of obvious gap in coverage is a, a triangle between Dungarvan, Yall, and Carrick and Shiva. And I've often felt that that must be the shadow of, uh, you know, the defeat in, in West Waterford in 1923. Having said that, the Union did survive in the city and the east uh, and was, remained one of the stronger points at a point when Transport Union membership was collapsing nationally, as was trade union membership generally, uh, declining till it, till it began to recover in 1932. But the union has been sort of clobbered by various people for quote, abandoning the, um, the members of Watford. Again, in that book, Bread Not Profits, there's a table showing you the weekly payments uh, to the Watford branches during the strike. A document, by the way, here in the, in the building, uh, you can consult it past in the state. Uh, letters in from the branches and stuff. Uh, um, there's com com constant complaint from head office and the little a a annotations on the formal documents saying something along the lines of they're not even benefit members. <laughs> uh, and if you think about it, they couldn't have been benefit members because they were in most cases seasonally employed yeah. and therefore sort of rejoined the union and technically in terms of the rule book wouldn't have achieved, achieved benefit status before they would uh, mm. start to pay strike mm. benefit. Yeah. The second thing is you've got to see the strike from the transit unit's point of view in the context that there was a strike somewhere every day of the year in 1923. And at the end of the year, uh, and Larkin, when he comes back, talks about the union sort of abandoning its soul. It spent 156% of its entire income on strike pay without ever balloting, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, levying members. <coughs> Extraordinary commitment. Uh, you know, and if, if, if you like, to, these to balance it. So Warford, as a strike, has to be looked at in the context of other strikes elsewhere. And also, of course, by December, the strike was not winnable. You know, what was the point to some extent of maintaining it? However, they did give a Christmas bonus, which I don't think has been reported before. That uh, comes out of the uh, records that are here. And that was done as a sort of gesture of, of you know, okay, we're not going to support you, but at least we'll we can guarantee some sort of, uh, uh, some sort of uh, uh, Christmas. Uh, and the final one uh, to say is the uh, Christy Supple piece is worth just having a look at. And I'm sure at your own research, uh, it, when you publish it, will show the same thing. There is a clear path for farmers to the military because Supple, like the people you mentioned, was arrested for no reason whatsoever, really. 
at least no, uh, nothing that would stand up in court, is held at the request of farmers until and unless he was to instruct his members to return to work, which of course he refused to do. And such was the class viciousness that when his mother heard, it, he was which she was widow, when his mother heard that he was to be released from Carl Barracks, she goes up to the town uh, and then discovered he wasn't going to be released and dropped dead in the Transport Union office. Something which I think is really quite extraordinary in the cultural terms of how we treat death. They wouldn't even let him out for the funeral, yeah. even on the guard, which I thought was <laughs> quite, quite, you know, quite a pernicious and nasty thing to do. So a uh, very good pact, and as I say, I hope we see it in yeah. Britain say it. Can I make a couple of comments there? At its height, there were 27 branches of the Transport Union in Morford City and County. A year after the strike, there were two, one in Dungarvan and one small one in Warford City. And a year later, the Dungarvan one had equally disappeared. But what you saw then was the growth of the amalgamated transport in General Workers' Union in Warford City on that. And rightly or wrongly, now you know the old phrase from Brendan Bean that if you get the reputation of being an early riser, you can stay in bed all day. You know? <laughs> now, the same way, for better or for worse, Waterford got the reputation of being militantly trade unionist. And, and this is just speaking off the record and so on like that. I remember the company that I worked on, we were building a plant down in Cork, okay, in the pharmaceutical industry. And I remember when we were signing up and so on like that, chatting with the then section head of the IDA, and this is in the 1980s, and saying to him, would you not put a couple of good, strong pharma industry, big plants, into Waterford? And he said to me, and as uh, everyone was just off the record chatting, said, and Patty said, with Warford's reputation, we can't. American companies in particular shy away from it. And I said to him, I looked at him and I said, here, and I said, I suppose the fact that the Docker strike in Warford is now entering its ninth year <laughs> doesn't really help you. And he said, you've got to do it. <laughs> but Warford did suffer, I believe, because rightly or wrongly, it got that reputation of being difficult. Yeah. I know a lot of people probably disagree with me on that, but that's what I believe. No, and uh, I think that's maybe a, a, a good point to uh, so conclude. Like, this. Way, the, the people here that are not aware of it, Jim, Jimmy Baird was mentioned there, kind of yeah. a has just published a, a, a great biography of him. It's worth reading. Yeah, on that in particular, his efforts in the um, Belfast, but I do think he was the wrong man in the wrong place for that particular dispute. You know, I'm okay. preaching that the farmers had no right to the land except the right of Cromwell. Uh, it's not really the words of compromise, really. You know? <laughs> and, and indeed, perhaps touches on a subtext uh, around a lot of those agrarian industrial disputes. Was it really a struggle for land, or was it a struggle for you know the improvement of the working class? Uh, and you know, in that fluid society of you know the decline of the British rule and the free state, you know, not having established yeah. itself and all the conflicts around that, it, it, it kind of the currency that was valued most by most of the population was land ownership yeah. rather than better wages. Uh, so maybe there's more work to be had there. This, can we thank Pat for a fantastic contribution? <laughs> and I would certainly echo Francis's appeal to maybe convert this into an article for, for a future seminar.